This episode of F1 Beyond the Grid is brought to you by Salesforce, the global partner of Formula One. Visit salesforce.com slash F1 to learn more about how Formula One wows fans and grows its global fan base with Salesforce. McLaren's transformation in 2023 has been nothing short of sensational. It is another magnificent weekend for McLaren. Oscar Piastri ahead of Lando Norris, a double podium for McLaren for the second race weekend in a row. From the back of the grid at Bahrain to a plethora of podiums since Silverstone, McLaren are now one of the leading candidates to challenge Red Bull's dominance in 2024. In Lando Norris and Oscar Piastri, they have one of the most exciting driver lineups in Formula One. And now it's down to the team and their leader, Andrea Stella, to provide them with a winning machine. You need to learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable because this journey is necessarily going to be uncomfortable. If anything is more on us now than on the drivers, we need to make sure we give these guys a good car and drivers, they are not going to be a problem at all. Hello and welcome to F1 Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. Stella by name, Stella by nature. McLaren's team principal has had a seriously impressive career in Formula One. As Michael Schumacher's performance engineer at Ferrari, Andrea helped the German win his last three world championships in 2002 to 2004. And in the same role three years later, he guided Kimi Raikkonen to the 2007 world title. Five years as Fernando Alonso's race engineer at Ferrari followed, before Stella switched to become head of race operations at McLaren in 2015. He progressed through the ranks and was promoted to team principal for this 2023 season. Zero points from the opening couple of races suggested an underwhelming year was on the cards, but a significant technical restructure and a new direction for car development saw McLaren leapfrog up the order and the MCL60 is now the second fastest car at many of the races. In a management masterclass, Andrea explains how the team has turned things around this year. He gives us his thoughts on Norris and Piastri, and he tells me what to expect from the team in 2024. Any time spent in Andrea's company feels like a lesson in how to go motor racing. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Andrea, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you for Thank your you. time. How are things? They are um, okay, I would say. We've seen a remarkable turnaround by McLaren this year. What is it? 17 points in the opening eight races and then 145 points in the next eight races. Have you exceeded your own expectations? As you may know, I'm not one that uh, works by targets or expectations. I really work by process, by identifying what's the right approach, what's the right vision, and then let results come to you. Uh, but in this case, uh, statistics in end, uh, I would say that, um, yes, if you had asked me like six months ago, I would say, I would have said like, mm, that's never going to be possible. Somehow this has happened, which is a credit 100% to the entire team at McLaren that um, embraced the vision and the approach that we set and uh, transformed that into performance project that once delivered to the car, uh, made the, the car much more competitive and allowed Lando and uh, Oscar to score uh, that many points. If you took this car now back to Bahrain, first race of the season, if you took it back to Bahrain now, how much faster would it be? I would say we would be seven, eight tenths quicker, which I think at the time would have been uh, close to, you know, second row on the grid, uh, second, third row on the grid. So from a competitiveness point of view, similar to what we have seen recently. Certainly short of one second, no more than that. Can we delve a little bit deeper into what you've done to this car and tell us how difficult it's been to rectify the shortcomings of the MCL60? Well, rather than uh, shortcomings, 
in terms of uh, like there was um, something wrong, I think the main um, issue with the car was that it was uh, underdeveloped in several areas. From an aerodynamic point of view, I would say it was underdeveloped in um, various components, but it wasn't only aerodynamics. There were some other uh, aspects of the design that um, could have been um, exploited more and this is what uh, what we did so it wasn't simply rectifying issues it was more about accelerating development and making sure that this development is uh, as overarching as possible considering all the areas of the car where uh, you can generate performance and lap time how easy was it to hit on the right development path was everyone agreed about what to do with the car for me, the focus, the real uh, aspect on which um, I needed to focus and uh, I needed to work on this with the key people in the team was uh, the approach. What is the approach? What is the vision? And um, like I said um, in the previous question, just almost let results come to you. Let's not think about results. Let's just think about how do we deliver performance projects in these many areas of the car such that we can be uh, innovative, such that we can be uh, fast in developing, but also developing at a pace that is uh, sustainable over time. We don't want to have uh, an impulsive delivery of a project and then run out of steam for three months. We want to have sustained improvement, especially from the aerodynamic point of view, in all areas of the car. So this was the kind of mission statement. And um, I can't be grateful and thankful enough to the people that I could work with and all the people in the team for how uh, enthusiastically they embraced this approach. So that's actually what happened. The fact that you then deliver a couple of good upgrades is just a result. But if you only think about upgrades without creating the conditions for this to happen, you can get lost very easily. I'm really interested to hear about your management because you are actually an engineer, aerospace engineering in Rome and then a PhD in aerodynamics. So you, you haven't been on a course about how to be a team principal, yet you seem to know how to lead is that natural or is it something you've just developed over the last 25 years in Formula One from observing Ross Braun to Jean Todd to Zach Brown? I've been uh, exposed to collaborating with people that were just excellent. They gave the sense of uh, the level of motivation you need to actually be successful, which is slightly beyond what most people are comfortable with. That's why I think if you want to be part of uh, our journey, uh, something we state very clearly at McLaren is you need to learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable because this journey is necessarily going to be uncomfortable. But somehow it's for us, especially in a leadership positions, to create the conditions for this discomfort to be enjoyable. And that's where... Uh, Personal relationships as well become uh, a key element. And again, if I think back about my years at Ferrari, I saw, by example, leaders behaving in demonstrating that personal relationships are important. They demonstrated, and for me as a, you know, a junior engineer, I, was, uh, I received a strong imprinting. I was green in a way. And then just saw... The culture, establishing a culture in a team, what the role this had. I'm not sure at the time, like at the time there was less talk about culture in uh, teams. Now you know, there's so many books, so many courses. Uh, it's really a topic, you know, talking about culture. But at the time, this was something alive. It was something that you could experience, live and breathe uh, every day. For me, I think it's just then uh, having received this imprinting and having being exposed to working with these uh, excellent people, it was more about um, development, you know, but kind of the script was almost set. And then you need to evolve, develop, 
And certainly uh, for doing that, if anything, you need to be open-minded and make sure that your ego doesn't get in the way. Comfortable being uncomfortable. Well, how nervous, how uncomfortable were you feeling going to Austria with that first upgrade? Because there was quite a lot on the line going there, wasn't there? I have to say that um, in developing the Austria uh, upgrade, uh, while we were in development, we got uh, reassurances that um, correlation had uh, high probability to be good with the track, let's say. Correlation is never perfect and should never be given for granted and should always uh, be approached in a very cautious way. But during the development of that upgrade, we had um, some uh, hints, some um, steps which um, increased our level of confidence. So, in fairness, we were, um, like, we approached the, the, the car on the ground with, um, with optimism. And I think it was a sprint event, wasn't it? So, and we decided to do it at a sprint event because we had this reassurance along the way, let's say. Can you remember Lando's first words describing the car after the first run at the Red Bull Ring? In reality, I remember my first impression because the program was such that I think we started immediately with some continuous laps. So you couldn't necessarily see the outright lap time. But I remember myself, I mean, looking immediately at overlays. And while looking at overlays, I could see that the speed we were carrying in the corners compared to the other car was like encouraging. <laughs> and I said to myself, uh, this extra speed we are carrying must be coming from the car. So I was trying to sort of uh, give myself some positive messages. And then it was good that um, actually this was um, entirely confirmed in the data and then in the, um, in the clock somehow because the car effectively gained uh, a few tenths from a lap time point of view. Can we talk about the drivers actually? What a race for McLaren. What a brilliant race for Lando Norris, who comes home to finish in second place and equal his best in Formula One. That's how we do it. Congratulations, guys. We're coming for Red Bull. Lando, he continues to improve year on year. What's impressed you about him this year? First of all, I think, again, you make um, a very valid point. And this point... Uh, which you make like it's obvious, it goes back to one of those um, elements of which everyone talk about, you know, improving every year. Uh, but how many people approach this with real determination to take every single opportunity to actually improve? And that's what makes the difference. And I have to say that um, now that you made this question, you make me uh, remember like when Lando joined the team, he was a ma almost like mature from this point of view. I think clearly he went through a journey in his junior categories. He must, he must have been supported very well in terms of uh, maturing the importance of this element. So he already had the mindset of this continuous improvement. He is obviously right now establishing as one of the top driver uh, in uh, Formula One. And um, in addition to confirming his uh, natural speed, I think what's becoming more and more apparent is his, uh, uh, how bigger and bigger his racecraft becoming. For instance, we saw how well he could cope with the shortcomings from a balance point of view of uh, what we often call like the McLaren characteristics which we are working hard to remove off the car, but he kind of adapted. And he adapted thanks to these continuous improvements. You just don't adapt from one day to the other. It's always going to be a game of marginal gains, and it's always going to be like you almost uh, don't recall exactly when you took a significant step. It's just little steps every single day, but require the determination that um, I was talking about at the start. And also, one element that um, shows the maturity is how Lando kept being supportive of the team, even when the team wasn't performing very well. And, um, you know, we had a mission, which was to provide Lando with a successful car, 
definitely we were not meeting this expectation at the start of the season, he kept being supportive. And um, what I'm very pleased about is that this gained Lando uh, the authority in a way and the respect within the team. You know, it goes back to the culture, goes back to the personal elements that are important in uh, such a long journey. And I think in the behavior, in the example Lando gave when things weren't working very well, he gained these uh, ranks. And in terms of how he drives the car, what really stands out for you? First of all, uh, Lando, it gives you the characteristic, like some other top drivers that I was uh, lucky enough to work with, that their um, perception of time is like zoomed in very much. Like he talks about one th- what happens in alpha second, like if it happened in one hour, you know, like the capacity to perceive, isolate all the little things that happen from his point of view as a driver or from uh, what's happening uh, with the car is pretty impressive. Like, you know, you can zoom your telemetry in and make this alpha second become the entire laptop screen. But then you always need, when you look at the timestamp, you see, wow, this happened in two tenths of a second. So that's um, a very impressive quality, which I then associate with uh, the natural speed. You've worked with some of the great drivers, as you say, Michael Schumacher, Kimi Räikkönen, and Fernando Alonso, to name three. Can we talk about Lando in the same breath as those guys yet? I think the ingredients for Lando to be able to succeed, like these uh, drivers have been able to succeed, uh, are uh, coming together. And when it is about like natural speed, I think Lando can compete with some of these uh, big names like uh, Schumacher or uh, Fernando Alonso. The real uh, success factor is in making your racecraft bigger and bigger, creating as much as possible adaptability because you're never going to have the perfect car you're never going to have the perfect situation. It can happen. You may have a dominant car, but this um, is the best scenario possible. We want to succeed even when uh, there's a 50-50 probability to do that. Then you want to make the difference through your uh, continuous improvements, adaptability, understanding the situation better than your competitors and gaining uh, a competitive advantage. And uh, definitely Lando is on a very strong path from this point of view. And I think evidence is that as soon as we gave him a car that was able to compete for podiums, he just achieved it. So he's clearly there. I think the, if anything, is more on us now to give him uh, the machinery to be able to capitalize on his, uh, on his qualities. Can you feel any frustration coming in now that, he's still yet to win a race and you know Russia 2021 that still looms large in the memory and as you say he's doing so much right is there any frustration there you know I could give a political diplomatic answer here and say oh no you know he's doing so well no frustration but then I would say what kind of driver is this these guys they compete since when they are uh, young childs these guys they have this uh, natural inclination, ambition to win, not only to be fast. It's uh, something that is very deeply programmed in their DNA. So having been close to winning races and not having been able to do it or uh, having this clear ambition and realizing that you're not going to compete for points like it happened at the start of the season, it must create quite a significant blackout in this uh, natural wide framing uh, this kind of drivers have. So I would be surprised if there was no hints at all. I would say this is a robot or he's lying to us and we don't want him to be a robot and we don't want him to lie to us. We need to be natural and we cope with it. But what makes the difference is that he kept being functional constructive, instrumental to the progress of the team. That's the real difference. It's not to suppress or negate your ambition, your feelings. They are the engine, they are the energy that drives our continuous improvements. 
is how functionally you approach them, especially when you are part of a team. That's what makes the difference. And that's what has made the difference in the respect and the authority that Lando has gained in the team for his own behavior. This episode is brought to you by Salesforce, the global partner of Formula One. Formula One is full of exciting moments and they keep all 500 million of their fans closer to the action than ever before with the help of Salesforce. Remember when Lando Norris took the lead of the British Grand Prix this year? Or Oscar Piastri's brilliant F1 sprint victory for McLaren in Qatar? Electrifying! Salesforce gives Formula One a single, shared view of every fan so they can deliver one-in-a-kind data-driven experiences and race day updates that keep fans on the edge of their seats, whether they're at home, at the track or on the go. With real-time data and actionable insights, Formula One puts every fan in the cockpit. Visit salesforce.com F1 to learn more about how Formula One wows fans and grows its global fan base with Salesforce. Oscar Piastri is on his way to victory in Formula One in his rookie season at his 17th Grand Prix weekend. Oscar Piastri has done the job brilliantly. The Australian driver will see the chequered flag first. Oscar Piastri wins the sprint to take McLaren to the top step once again. Very nicely done, everyone. What about Oscar Piastri? Given your efforts to get him, what did you expect from Oscar in year one? There were clearly uh, strong efforts <laughs> to get uh, Oscar, and uh, that was very much based on what he had achieved in the junior categories. But once we started working with him, we kind of understood, like, first of all, those efforts were uh, worthwhile, and we also understood why he was so successful in the junior categories, winning championships for three times in a row at the first attempt which is, you know, even now that we say that, like when I said, like, that's remarkable. Like, I never want to give it for, uh, for granted. And what we saw is that, um, you know, it goes back in this category of drivers that you put them in a car, you put them at the simulator, and they just immediately show their natural speed. And for Oscar, I would say, especially in ice peak corners, almost his um, uh, most natural ground. Normally drivers are more comfortable in low speed, but Oscar is almost like, doesn't really perceive the, you know, the associated elements of being so fast, so marginal with the fact that if you are half a meter too wide, things can become, you know, slightly difficult. He seems to be in his comfort zone in these high speed corners. And then uh, more technically is working on developing the low speed stuff. And as he does this um, sort of development journey, what impressed us is his awareness, his awareness of what the opportunities are, even before he looks at an overlay or looks at any telemetry. He kind of has this uh, capacity to self-recognize where uh, there's more to come from either himself or from the car. And this is uh, not so obvious. I know drivers that can be fast, but they kind of definitely need external support as to see what is possible, either from themselves or from the car. Oscar has this characteristic very developed in terms of uh, being a good judge of uh, these um, opportunities. Can we take Japan as an example? Given what you say about fast corners, it's not a surprise that he gets his first front row at Suzuka, which is unbelievably fast. And then, of course, the first podium. But even after the celebrations in Suzuka, he also said, I wasn't fast enough in the race. And Is that what you're talking about? Him being able to see immediately that there was more to come? Actually, what I'm talking about is more uh, what led him in the space of a few runs like you have available now from being the first laps in a Formula One car in Suzuka, which is not only high speed, but is an old school track, is narrow. And as soon as you put the wheels one meter too wide, you may find the gravel and you may see the barrier coming like very fast. So 
it's more how rapidly he progressed from this, uh, like being a rookie driver in Suzuka to put in the car on the first row. That's a, a, quite an impressive journey if you consider uh, what, how rapid you need to not only identify the opportunities, but uh, sort of uh, embed in your own driving, in what your hands are and, and feet and, and what your brain is going to process at quite high speed and drive the car as fast as he did. This has been uh, very considerable from a rapidity point of view. I think when we go to his comment after the race, instead, I think, is where he shows that he's a rookie. And uh, if anything, to be consistent in the race is where experience actually plays a, a fundamental part. Because while uh, in maximizing one lap, you know, you kind of can get quite a lot out of uh, practice because you do many times a single lap. Having 20 laps a stint, you do it the first time in a race. So uh, y you can do continuous laps in practice, but practice is one hour in P1, one hour in P2, one hour in P3, and it's qualifying already. And you need to think about preparing qualifying as you do practice. So I think this aspect of uh, the race is where uh, experience does play a, a part. And um, I think it just kind of acknowledged, I know I could have done better. And in fairness, in the final stint, I think he had already capitalized some of the learning through the race and he cashed him some improved performance. So he's definitely a quick learner. He has a, a large capability from a self-awareness point of view. And then he has this uh, capacity and capability to then um, drive according to the opportunity identified, which for me is a definition of talent. When you talk about the importance of experience, how good can Piastri get in five years' time? It's one of those that goes back to the fact that I don't really work by targets. I don't really work by projection. I only work by Oscar, team around Oscar, McLaren. What do we need to keep this pace of development? And then we see where we end up in five years. Let's say, if I really needed to project, in the first season, he puts the car P2 in qualifying in uh, Japan. It means the gradient is quite steep. For me, actually, Tom, he, he, as you made this question, I felt immediately the responsibility more on me than on the drivers, me and the team. Like, we need to make sure we give these guys a good car. And drivers, they are not going to be a problem at all. You did spend 15 years at Ferrari. So what did the Tifosi make of you, an Italian, becoming the team principal of one of the Ferrari's arch rivals? <laughs> You're now a garagiste, as Enzo would say. Well, first of all, I'm humbled, very, very respectful of mentioning Enzo and the garagisti because that's, an, uh, that's a, such a fascinating era of Formula One. Uh, you know, every time there's a documentary or something that goes back to that time, I always uh, watch it with great interest. I think this difference now obviously doesn't exist anymore, even though, yeah, I can definitely recall that there was some emphasis on me being Italian or me coming from Ferrari and now uh, being team principal at McLaren. But to be honest, I haven't seen anything that was out of kilter. <laughs> so I think uh, all these reactions were actually quite balanced. And um, if anything, I was uh, very pleased and refreshed by how encouraging the overall, uh, how this was received uh, in Italy. We have to remember that I've been at McLaren since 2015, so it was not like a move straight from Ferrari to becoming team principal. I was already properly embedded within McLaren and perceived as a McLaren uh, employee, uh, so I don't think this was a, such a discontinuity in this respect. Let's talk a little bit about Ferrari now. How did you end up working there? 2000 was when you moved, wasn't it? It was 2000. I ended up working at Ferrari thanks to the fact that Ferrari were um, in the process of selecting a couple of uh, young engineers uh, 
to work as performance engineers for the test team. At the time, testing was free. So there was, um, at Ferrari, I think, at some stage, we had the three test teams, you know, to go testing, tire testing. So there was this um, selection process. Ferrari kind of asked some universities if they had some names that they wanted to suggest of people that had uh, interest for Formula One. I had uh, already had the chance to express my interest for Formula One with the people working with me and the tutor of my PhD thesis. And I was, uh, I would say, properly lucky that there was uh, this uh, knowledge from one person to the other and I ended up in the pool of the candidates. What was it like to have three test teams, to have all that resource behind you? And how different was Formula One back then, I suppose? It was different because uh, right now you try to maximize what you can do to generate as much performance as possible within constraints. You know, as soon as you have an idea, as soon as you say, I want to go testing there, I would like to make this uh, uh, development uh, from a car point of view, you immediately need to frame this uh, project or this idea within some kind of restrictions in the regulations. And this is not a negative comment. I think these restrictions are there for a reason. This reason helps creating a, a level playing field and I think helps creating and securing the longevity of this sport and um, the viability, even from a financial point of view, of this sport. If you think um, 23, 24 years ago, and you had an idea about how you can improve performance, in most of the cases, you didn't have these restrictions. So it was all about uh, how we can make it happen, you know, who do we need? What resources we need? Where do we need to go? Oh, we could go testing tires with a team that only tests tires. Very good. Let's create it. I think this is the very fundamental approach. You are forced now to think within boundaries. While at the time you were almost uh, simply forced to think, uh, how can I go an extra mile compared to my competitors? You're in the throes of trying to make McLaren the winning machine. But what made Ferrari so devastatingly effective back then? And is there anything that you learned then that you can apply now? Or is the sport and the way you improve performance just so different now? In um, 2000, when I joined uh, Ferrari, that was a team that was uh, in a journey that started, um, I think, um, four or five years before with Jean Todd, Michael Schumacher, Ross Braun, Rory Byrne, gradually joining the team, James Ellison, Nicolas Tombasis. And I think um, already in uh, kind of uh, mentioning these uh, kind of calibers, I'm answering your question. The main uh, element, I think, was the seniority, the quality of the people involved. It was just extraordinary. I think some of them, they even accepted to stay in a certain role, knowing that they were absolutely ready to pick one higher level or two higher level had they gone to another team, but they kind of accepted to stay in that role because that's what it was needed to create uh, what was possibly the strongest team, you know, that we have seen in Formula One just accepting that their seniority was required to create these uh, incredible standards in every single area. And, uh, you know, like Luigi Mazzola was leading the test team, even from an engine point of view, the people I had um, the luck to collaborate with, Pino D'Agostino, like so senior, so competent, so expert, like every conversation was just for me such a rapid increase of what, um, uh, of what I knew about Formula One. So I think quality and seniority of the people was the main um, element. All these uh, led by Luca di Montezemolo. I don't think I need to comment very much about uh, Luca di Montezemolo. Incredibly successful. A Ferrari, Ferrari red inside, 
individual, super charismatic, a real uh, team builder. Every meeting with him, you come out of the meeting like, uh, I feel part of this team. I feel like I want to work with my mates. I feel like I want to contribute to make this team successful. And then we had Michael. Michael, it just was the emotional engine, almost I would say, just the energy drive, like his ambition, his drive to win was, um, I don't know, like um, I struggled to find the right attributes because if anything with Michael, like this um, ambition to succeed, uh, it was so big that needed a team to manage it. You know, it needed some, uh, like the Jean Todd, uh, Ross Braun, uh, Luca Di Montezemolo, around Michael to kind of balance and create uh, and, and distribute this ambition across multiple people. So when you say he was the emotional engine, because from the outside looking in, I felt he was quite cold, quite like an automaton. But uh, no, you're saying he was the emotional engine of Ferrari. Absolutely. Like what or by emotion, do you mean ambition? No, no, just um, generating emotions. Generating emotions, uh, you know, like uh, I think energy comes from emotions, you know. He was fueling energy in the team by his uh, commitment, by his determination, by his ambition to succeed uh, for himself and for Ferrari. And everyone kind of got, uh, you know, he was very contagious, you know, like if you weren't motivated and you happened to work with him, your level of motivation became immediately. And for you, like the being comfortable to be uncomfortable was really regular. It was like a day in the office. That's the standard because we are here to succeed. There's no other option if you want. And uh, we are here to succeed, but we are mates. You know, that's the real element, which again travels on an emotional kind of uh, pathway, I've said in a recent interview, that was um, a sense of family. Like the people in this journey, they felt not only mates, but they felt like we are connected at personal level. And Michael was a very sensitive person, you know, very, he needed to connect with the team. I think he needed to connect with the team to kind of carry this enormous ambition to succeed. The message was, can we do it together? But actually the way you could do that together with him was provide him with the solutions to succeed, being it the car, being it the setup of the car, being it the traction control, engine braking, differential control that, for instance, at the time I was taking care of, being it with uh, understanding the right approach to a corner, which we could work together looking at an overlay. That was the way to contribute to him. And you could be pretty sure that he would uh, transform it into a success. So brilliant outside of the car. And what made Michael so brilliant inside the car? First of all, uh, Michael was uh, fast. I wasn't there at the time where Eddie Irvine was his teammate, but I understood some comments of Eddie like, wow, that just unbelievable. Like he was talking about his teammate, you know. It was almost discouraging sometimes for the teammate how fast and how rapidly fast it could be. You know, like there was at the time some limitations with the engine mileage. So in free practice one, I remember we were going for one lap in free practice one. And the single one lap in free practice one, it was just like so naturally fast. Didn't need to build up. Didn't need to kind of find the references. And I think this was coming from the fact that it was um, his control his control of the car, especially control of the uh, rear end of the car, uh, he was just very gifted. He was uh, entering the corner as fast as he could think. Like it, his perception of speed was, uh, you enter as fast as possible, and then let's see how we can manage to get out of this corner. Which actually meant that, for instance, when uh, Rubens was his teammate, they were very complimentary because Rubens was very good in corner exit. So, you know, looking at the overlays, I think for Michael it was clear, like in some places, we can't be so aggressive in entry. We need to think more about exit and that's how you can do that to gain some time. So they were benefit very much, Rubens and Michael, from working, you know, together as teammates. And then he was very quick in high speed. And at the time, uh, there was much more high speed than now 
because with the current generation of car or even the previous generation of car, there's so much grip that some of the high-speed corners, they are actually flat or they, the duration is minimal. But at the time, with groove tires, V10 engines, the corners, they were corners. Like corner one in Suzuka, which now the drivers don't even think there's a corner, it was making the difference for lap time. And uh, that was a corner in which, for instance, he was just entering in a way that the teammate might have thought like, I'm not sure I'm, gonna, I'm going to attempt this. Maybe I just accept I'm going to lose a tent here. So at the time, these characteristics of corner entry and high speed, they were uh, very rewarding, but also meant that it was, for instance, very aggressive on the rear tires or sometimes we were losing some time in exit. So we needed to work on these things. We needed to work because when we needed to select the tire for a weekend, I remember often Rubens could select softer tires because he didn't have blister and we were blistering with Michael. So then you are quicker, but you need to use harder tires and you are kind of, uh, that's not real economics because we are giving away being quicker as a driver for the fact that we need to use uh, harder compounds. So we needed to work together with the other engineers, obviously, uh, on, these, um, on these features. And when you needed to work on these aspects, you could see the adaptability was also a, a very developed quality and ultimately is uh, intelligence, just the cleverness, you know, just the neurons, they were uh, very powerful in that individual. This episode is brought to you by Salesforce, global partner of Formula One. With Salesforce, Formula One has the real-time data and actionable insights it needs to turbocharge fan engagement. From race day updates to perfectly personalized offers, Formula One delivers experiences that turn new fans into loyal ones. Visit salesforce.com F1 to learn more about how Formula One wows fans and grows its global fan base with Salesforce. While at Ferrari, you also engineered Valentino Rossi when he did a series of tests with the team. How did he adapt to four wheels? I remember being at a test at Valencia and thinking he was, he was pretty rapid. I remember the test in Valencia because I think we had the other Ferrari on track. I think it was an open test, if that's the same test in Valencia. because It was an open test, yeah. So there was the other Ferrari which I think uh, at one day was Michael. I think we were changing driver. And um, I remember Michael looking at uh, Valentino's telemetry and, you know, like, um, mm, interesting. As in impressed by his telemetry. Interesting for Michael was, uh, yeah, maybe the translation would be, that's impressive. This guy is quick. He's very competitive. So, like, he could see that there was somebody quite talented. But Valentino, I think the mo most interesting thing is that when he started, he was completely green of driving single-seater. And I remember the first test in Fiorano, which was on the 2004 car, I think, which is one of the quickest Formula One ever. It just couldn't generate any grip because it couldn't go quick enough to actually generate any temperature in the tires. And he said, uh, like, there's absolutely, like, I'm on ice. Like, I don't want to drive this car. There was a bit of an impasse. So uh, Luigi Mazzola was uh, in charge of this program and he was the, the leader of the test team. He said, uh, well, let's put the intermediate tires in the dry. So then uh, by going around on inters, he started to feel that actually these cars can be quite quick if you sort of believe it, because if you believe it, then you get the aerodynamic premium. While the, the slower you go, the lower this premium fades off. So this Formula One, unlike bikes, kind of needed a bit of reprogramming as to how much you need to believe that you can carry speed. Because if you carry speed, you're going to get downforce. So that was an interesting start of the journey with him. There were also some qualities, like for instance, the active listening of all the drivers I work with is the one that puts himself, even from a non-verbal point of view, even his, like his uh, posture as he listens, he listens very actively. You know, in itself, this quality wouldn't mean very much, but clearly he had a process. The process was like, I need to understand exactly what these guys are telling me 
and he trusted us in doing so. And I think this element of trust in the team is a common trait of the biggest champions I work with. You know, just talking about previous drivers. If I think about Michael, if I think about Fernando, if I think about Valentino, they trust the people they work with. You need to somehow gain their trust, but they never put themselves in a position where, oh, now you have to convince me. They always stay with you at your level as you start this process of gaining the trust. They never put themselves on the podium, one step upper. They stay with you independently of the starting point. Like if I think myself, after two years in Formula One, being performance engineer of Michael Schumacher, clearly I was miles behind where he was. But I never felt I was in this position. I always felt he was there with me at the same level. And then he needed to take me through the journey, like I hope, hopefully, I was able to contribute to his journey. But is this uh, balanced approach and this ultimate sense of we do have to trust each other that is the common trait to, to these great champions. Did Rossi get down to a good lap time eventually? Did he look like a Formula One driver by the end? Normally, at the end of a test session, and like I said, we had, I think, uh, eight tests with Valentino. Like at the end of a day or at the end of a couple of days of testing, he was always... Uh, in some places able to be very, very close to the references or uh, giving the sense he will get to this uh, level. And our assessment and our recommendation at the time was uh, he can be a Formula One driver, he needs a one year of testing. The thing is that there's a difference between uh, ultimately being able to match and first race in Australia, free practice one, you have the walls around you and maybe, you know what, there's a little bit of rain and the session is useless and there's qualifying in um, effectively three hours. It's, it's a different thing from saying in one day or two days of testing, it could match the reference. There's no time in a race weekend to go through that systematic approach. The speed needs to be natural. You need to be able to access your resources very rapidly and this is uh, training, this is uh, uh, just what comes with uh, practice, with continuing the, the work that we had started. So, you know, in, I think this is true in any sport. It's not because we can't see the drivers driving, even if now we have the cameras that show their feet and so on, that we think, oh, you get in the car and you drive. It's the same thing in any sport. So our recommendation, one year of testing, and we can go to Australia and whatever conditions we find is going to be all right. And he wasn't prepared to wait. I think he must have been um, considering the matter quite uh, deeply. Uh, but obviously it would have meant giving up motorbike racing. So here actually you need to ask Valentino. Maybe that's a good subject for our next uh, podcast. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Look. Andrea, I've kept you for so long. I feel like this is a lesson in motor racing, what I'm listening to now. It's fascinating. Can I ask you just one question about Fernando Alonso? Maybe we can talk another time in more detail about him. But how close to recreating what Schumacher had at Ferrari did Fernando get? It's an interesting question. We certainly went uh, very, very close to succeeding in his first year at Ferrari, which is uh, very different to how Michael started the journey, if you think. Like he had three victories, pretty much out of his immense talent, rather than outright competitiveness of, uh, of the car. I think uh, in Michael's journey, there's been uh, a proper journey. Like I said before, Ross came on board, Rory Bean came on board, James Ellison came on board. There was uh, so much continuity in this journey where you keep identifying what you need to add and you keep building brick by brick, if that makes sense. I think this is something that uh, we sort of missed during the Fernando era and we could have built it, but definitely would have needed a lot of continuity and this brick-by-brick brick approach that was 
somehow established as of uh, the mid 90 at Ferrari. And so the continuity and the seniority that succeeded so well at Ferrari, I'm sensing is what you're trying to create in Woking at McLaren. There's uh, some elements of the script that haven't changed over the years, independently of uh, the role that I've been on and uh, continuity and seniority, they do form uh, part of this uh, script. And this is what we are trying to, uh, to do at McLaren as well, yes. And then we've got the arrival of David Sanchez, Rob Marshall, others as well, I'm sure. So what does 2024 look like for the team? 2024, like uh, the development that we had in Austria, the development in Singapore and all the other areas that we have improved and that may be less visible, that's the result of the people that were already at McLaren. And 2024 car will be the result of the people that are already at McLaren. And I want to say this because, uh, like I said before, I can't be thankful and grateful enough for uh, not only the quality of the efforts that were profused at uh, McLaren by the team, but how the, you know, we goes back to the trust element, you know, that we said before. Independently of our position, we go hand in hand and we trust each other. And this is a characteristic that I could see and without which the work of the team would be disjointed. So in 2024, we will see what we are able to do in terms of uh, continuing with the development of the car we will have uh, and we already have in fairness a full exploitation of the infrastructure that came to fruition wind tunnel simulator manufacturing facilities as we have already said uh, repeatedly in the past and then uh, we definitely wanted to work on this seniority element bringing what we call horsepower to the team we want to compete with Red Bull, Mercedes, Ferrari. It's in itself is a daunting mission and we need to be well equipped. So we are uh, very excited that uh, David and Rob will uh, contribute with their um, expertise, with their experience, with their uh, uh, vision towards this generation of cars and also towards 2026. Like all teams, we'll have to face this uh, important challenge that is already in the agenda and you need to be equipped. Andrea, best of luck with everything that comes up. I've loved this chat so much and um, I hope you might come back on the pod one day in the future. I feel there's more to talk about, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Isn't Andrea impressive? so logical in his outlook and hugely motivational. He's very modest, but there's no doubt that McLaren's future is in safe hands. There are so many highlights from this last hour. Andrea's thoughts on Lando and Oscar, obviously, his management style and what he learned from Ferrari and how he's applying some of those lessons at McLaren as well. And what about those test sessions with Valentino Rossi? Just extraordinary. Andrea, many thanks for your time. It was great to chat and see you soon. Now, as ever, please send in your thoughts and stories about Andrea Stella. Are you impressed by him? Are you as impressed as I am? Let me know through all of the usual means. I'm at Tom Clarkson F1 on Twitter. Yes, I'm still struggling to call it X. Or you can use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Which brings us seamlessly on to what you sent in after last week's show with Vitantonio Liuzzi. It's fascinating to get your feedback about the drivers from the early noughties because there's a lot of love for them out there. And here are a handful of your messages about Tonio. Ashley Woodhouse, the brilliantly funny Vit Antonio Liuzzi chats to host Tom Clarkson in what is a greatly engrossing listen. In an F1 career spanning 12 years, Vit Antonio drove for Red Bull, Toro Rosso and Force India. And these days, he's sometimes an F1 driver steward. And it was fascinating to get an insight into that. You get a real impression that he's still a keen student of the sport and its technical side. I also loved hearing about all of his other activities outside motorsport. Well, thanks for that message, Ashley. It was great to hear from you. And what about this from Tatovic? Great podcast. The most interesting part for me was when he mentioned being in the restaurant business. Penelope a Casa Milano is my favorite restaurant when in Milan. I celebrated my birthday there last year. So awesome to know that it's owned by a former F1 driver. Well, 
There you go. Now you know. Thanks for the note, Tatavik. And finally, what about this from Project DRS? Man, I loved watching Tonio in Formula One. He really grabbed my attention at Force India. Clearly talented, right place, wrong time. Probably not a world champion, but easily a potential podium finisher and maybe a potential race winner. Well, I agree with everything you say there, Project DRS, and thanks for getting in touch. We'll leave it there for messages this week, but thank you to everyone who wrote in. And please remember to send in your thoughts and stories about Andrea Stella in time for next week's show. And before I go, a quick reminder that F1 Nation's preview of the United States Grand Prix with Damon Hill and myself is out now. We're joined by Mercedes Technical Director James Allison to discuss how the team bounces back from Qatar and Bobby Epstein, the promoter of the US Grand Prix. That's available now from wherever you listen to your podcasts. And thank you to you for listening. And of course, I'll be back next week with another great guest from the world of Formula One. F1 Beyond the Grid is produced by Formula One and Audio Boom Studios. Until next time, keep it flat out.